us uh, why American for the Arts was created and how did it happen? Yeah, um, that goes back 61 years. And it, we, we were created because there was a need out there. Um, you know, we had, you know, uh, post, you know, World War II, uh, there was booming economies, uh, but there was nothing about the arts and culture. And in the United States, you know, we don't have, you know, one arts and culture. We have a variety of different things from country music to jazz, uh, to hip hop, uh, to, you know, whatever, opera, ballet. And so it was kind of all over the place. And so there was no funding, no uh, positive public policy uh, uh, being spent on the arts. And so a lot of local, local like cities, you know, local arts organizations uh, came together uh, to say, hey, we need an organization on the national level uh, to advocate for us, to educate elected officials and their staff why the arts matter, why the arts and culture uh, is uh, something they should care about. Because so often the elected officials, to this day even too, um, is they have this preconceived notion of the arts are for the elite. The arts are for the Hollywoods of America or the, or, or the um, New York City's Broadway. But they don't realize that the arts really have a profound impact on you know, the uh, smaller rural cities across the country. And in the United States, um, there are, we have, you know, federal government, we have our 50 states, and then we have um, about 3,000 counties, which are sub-levels of states. Of those 3,000, only 177 are urban. The rest are rural. And the arts really have a profound impact on those rural areas, too. So, they came together and said, hey, we need an organization in Washington, D.C. to uh, advocate for the arts. And so that's how we were born again, about 61 years ago. And, you know, we were really born upon two main principles of advocacy and research. Uh, you have to be able to uh, have data to tell your story. What does the arts do for, you know, the United States or for, you know, uh, Virginia, where I live? or for Fairfax County where I live, you know, uh, or, you know, wherever you, you know, you need that data and then you need to advocate, you know, you know, for that. And so, you know, we have went from that, just a pure advocating for the arts money for the federal government to establish um, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, which, you know, they, they did. Uh, and then, you know, going down to creating each, you know, uh, state arts agencies. So each of our states have a state arts agency that acts like the National Endowment for the Arts here in America, uh, that they give out uh, a grant money uh, to, to arts, arts organizations. And so is that the, you know, the federal government was pushed state governments who pushed city and local governments to create local arts agencies, state arts agencies, county arts agencies, to again, shine a spotlight on the value that the arts and culture has or brings to your life, the economy, and to you know, where you live. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the strate strategic advocacy plan of American for the Arts? How is it organized? And what are the main activities right now? So, you know, our main you know, advocacy strategy plan is to uh, make sure that everyone realizes how central the arts and culture is to their lives. And it really get those key elected officials to go outside of their mindset of what they think the arts are. Again, you know, the arts are those symphonies, operas, ballets, which are all quite wonderful. But the arts are... Uh, anything from you know, that to you know to um, you know looking around you know where you know uh, my, my office here someone designed those bookshelves someone created the paint that goes onto my wall someone designed the house that I live in um, someone designs the the um, uh, roads that I drive on um, someone designs the parks or the clothes that I'm wearing so to really emphasize the arts are not that this narrow thing. The arts are this broad expanse 
uh, of activity in, in the United States and in Brazil, because uh, it's the same thing, uh, and getting people to recognize that. In the United States, I talked about we need research. So in the United States, the arts are 4.3% of our gross domestic product. So if you add up all the, the stuff that uh, American businesses produce, it is a $919 billion a year industry. Again, 4.3%. Um, that is actually a very large number. Uh, if you look at uh, construction or transportation or agriculture, the arts and culture are bigger than all those. Uh, and who would have thought that the arts are bigger than construction? Because that's a huge industry. Uh, we employ about 5 million people in the United States. Uh, and so, you know, we, and we contribute uh, you know, the, you know, about $27.5 billion in tax revenues, even though the governments of the United States, federal, state, and locals, only appropriate about $5 billion. So for every dollar that is appropriated to the arts in the United States, you know, they're getting about, about $5.5 in tax revenues that they can then spend on health and human services or new roads. Uh, or, or whatever the case happens to be. You know, so we just really wanna make sure that we properly educate and really make sure that people understand that uh, what the arts do. We have something that we call our creative, uh, and creative industries uh, and our econ arts and economic prosperity reports that really go into a lot of detail economically about this. And we spend a lot of time and money to produce these reports because we need to. And we don't limit ourselves to just talking about arts and, and money. Um, you know, we, one of our biggest areas right now is, that we talk about is arts and healthcare. How uh, certified arts therapists can help with our military uh, members coming back from overseas who suffer from post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome or traumatic brain injury and how the arts heal uh, people. Uh, or we talk about how arts help with, you know, um, one of our juvenile, uh, you know, who, who gets arrested and they go into a juvenile detention facility and how the arts can teach them, um, you know, stress uh, coping skills or, or anger management skills. And so when they get out, they're less likely to commit another crime because they know how to, um, you know, um, react to a situation. And instead of using anger, they, you know, use another skill and that saves money too. So there's tons of different uh, areas that we talk about that are not what you would traditionally think of the arts, but they're something that really contributes to the society of America and it helps us out. And that's one of the things that we are really working on at Americans for the Arts. And could you tell us uh, what are the main lessons that American for the Arts has learned throughout uh, these years in advocacy? Uh, the main lesson is advocacy never, ever ends. There's always a new someone getting elected. There's always a new, you know, you know uh, 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 someone who has control over purse strings or policy. And it's, it's important to continue to educate them. And what we, we tell people is it's much easier to educate someone uh, at the very local level. So in, our, in the United States, a city council person, and you probably have very similar there in Brazil, because a city council person oftentimes goes to become mayor. And a mayor oftentimes goes to become a state legislator or a governor. And a governor oftentimes becomes a, se a United States senator, and they oftentimes become president of the United States. And so if you can educate them down here about the value of the arts, as they go up you know, the political food chain, they still know what they learned down here. But if you don't tell them anything about the arts until they're up here, it's too late. You know, they're not gonna realize it. It's not gonna be part of their, who they are. And so we're always talking about educating at the very local level, because it's easy to get to them, to, re to establish a relationship with them. So when you do need something, they have the information, they know who you are, they know that you're a good person, they trust you, and they're gonna to listen to you. And hopefully then that makes better policy. And so it's a very long game. We always say the arts advocacy is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It takes, you know, it's it, you know, years to unpack this. You, you never know, you know, um, 
you know, uh, a lot of our senior leadership were very local elected officials 20 years ago, and now they are here. And so, you know, you know Americans for the Arts over our 61 year history have said, you know, we've, we, we understand that. We know it's the long game that we have to play, you know, year after year. But if we do that, we overlay it with great research, we overlay it with great advocates in the United States, in every uh, city and state in the United States. We have about a half a million people that are on our email list. So if there's a, a, a bill in, on Capitol Hill in, in Washington, D.C. that we need someone to vote or to, the, to, to they're going to vote on, you know, we send an email out and we get like 60, 70,000 emails in to the elected officials to say, vote for the arts. That's really important. And then doing that all the time you know it's 365 year, uh, days a year type of a thing and you do that all the time you're consistent you have good message you have good stories about why the arts matter and you have good research you'll be successful um, but uh, you said something that uh, advocacy never ends so uh, it's important to work with different stakeholders is it is a challenging uh, in, in advocacy uh, 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 plan. So could you tell us how America for the Art, Arts works with uh, different stakeholders, not only politicians, but also allies? Sure. So oftentimes when you think of advocacy, you think it's just solely targeted towards that elected official, whether they be on the federal, state, or local level. And that's that's the end goal, because they're the decision maker at the end of the day. But I talk about, when I talk about an advocacy program, I talk about an advocacy pie. And there's lots of pieces in each of the pies. So you have the you know, elected officials, um, then you know, that you have to, to uh, advocate to. Then you have like business uh, organizations that care about the arts. And if you can get, you know, educate them and to get them to talk about why the arts matter, that's another level. You have another level of, of the media. If you can get you know, um, uh, uh, letters to the editor or whatever newspaper articles about the positivity of the arts, that's another level because those key decision makers down here will read that up here you know, from, from the news or, or whatever the case is. You have the grass um, uh, uh, roots people. Those are that half a million that are emailing people in to say, you know, we want you to, to vote, you know, elected officials, we want you to vote you know, for something like this. Uh, and then you have something called grass tops. So grass tops are those of the grassroots that have a personal relationship with their elected official. So I'm a grass top in, in Virginia where I live because I know personally my elected officials. I have their cell phone numbers. They come to my house for my birthday party. I go to their house for theirs. And it's much harder to tell a friend no, uh, especially if you have a bunch of grassroots emails giving you political cover. So if you combine all of these things, you'll have a successful advocacy program. But if you only just do one or two, and they, they shift from you know, uh, you know, campaign to campaign, but if you holistically look at that, you know, you're gonna be more likely to succeed than not. Oh, it's, it's great because I used to say in Brazil that advocacy is not lobbying. It's not all, only about decision making politicians uh, is a strategy to bring change so uh, you can you have to use coalitions and as you said communication are you uh, agree with that oftentimes you just made a great point uh, Danny that uh, advocacy is not lobbying and uh, while advocacy can in certain instances in the United States be lobbying it's not I often talk about in, in the United States when I'm talking to our advocates, because we, we have very strict laws around lobbying in, in the United States of, you know, people get really scared, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I got, you know, about, you know, I'm going to email, or I'm going to go meet with my elected official. And I, when I talk, when I do like advocacy um, educational programs for our members, um, not elected officials, but our members, uh, I, I start out with some definitions. And it's like, and I, I talk about what is education? What is advocacy and then what is lobbying? Because they're all three different things. And in the United States, education is like 90% of your activity. You are educating that elected official about what the arts and culture actually do. That's all you're doing. You're just saying, hey, the arts are bigger than you think. The arts matter more than you think, stuff like that. Advocacy 
is when you are saying, I want you to support the arts. You know, um, you're building upon that education. And again, that's all that is. Lobbying in the United States is very specific. In, in the United States, you have to be talking about a specific piece of legislation. You have to be talking to a key decision maker, maybe an elected official or their staff, and you have to be advocating a certain position. So unless I am saying, you know, Senator McConnell, I want you to vote yes on S2020, I'm not lobbying. If I just go in and say, hey, you know, the arts are great, Senator McConnell, I'm educating. So people get really freaked out about that. And um, they shouldn't because, you know, it's, it's just a word. And then two, it's our right to go and advocate or lobby our elected officials to say, this is what we as society want and need. And if we don't do that, they're gonna assume that everything's fine. And that's shame on us, because we need to tell them what we want, what we need to make our society a better place. And you said in our previous event on March, I think you said to me, um, uh, you were saying that Brazil uh, has a challenge uh, regarding to civil society and advocacy and the United States is great. You said, no, it's, it's, it's not so great. But, uh, um, but American for the Art was created six years ago and it's very difficult to promote political change, structural change. So it's, it's difficult. So could you tell us why, in your point of view, civil society is so important to promote or stimulate change? Not, not only government, but the, the role of civil society. So as you probably know, in the United States, we have had a, a fairly interesting two years, uh, four years, actually, four and a half years. And the... the between the pandemic and our federal elections um, and, and everything that goes along with that. The thing about the arts is we are uh, a constant and we are one in, right now of the last things that bring people from different political backgrounds to one table. And I tell my arts folks, my arts uh, uh, organizations and their members and artists, that we have an, an increased responsibility right now as artists to bring people together who are separate on everything else and say, here's our commonalities, because our commonalities really do outsway or outweigh our differences. But those differences are what is being promoted right now. And so that's, that's, a, that's one of the problems. Two, artists can give words or visuals to things that are hard to uh, imagine or express. So when we were uh, through the summer, going through our Black Lives Matter, which continues, uh, but we don't hear about it quite as much, but it certainly continues and it's set up uh, a, a lot of conversation, a lot of change uh, in the United States. Um, it is those artists that brought a picture to that, that people could understand. I live in the, in the Metro DC area. I could go to a Black Lives Matter uh, march if I wanted to, and I did. But if I lived in rural America, I probably couldn't, I, I, there's probably not one around me. But through artists and arts uh, organizations, I can learn about this uh, in a way that's non-threatening, that, you know, that gives me the ability to understand without pushing me away. And so I always say the arts are that common language out there that really do unite us, whether it is um, politically uh, within our country or internationally, di diplomatically, you know, of how we can send an, an orchestra. We did this to North Korea years ago and that they learn from us and we learn from them. But it was about music. It wasn't necessarily about politics. And so we as, a, as, as artists have a, really do have an outsized responsibility right now of how to bring people together, how to unite the left and the right, how to help educate people about the struggles of some Americans or Brazilians who uh, don't have a lot of money, don't have political power, 
and who are really struggling. And we're a great way to do that. And, and that I think is our legacy, the artist's legacy. And you see that through history. The uh, things that last the longest are the arts in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a country or in a history there or, or in a culture. And we need to continue to do that. And we need to prop up and highlight and shine a spotlight on all of our artists who do that. And it's the same thing in Brazil, that you are struggling. Your members are struggling too, your, your, your citizens. There's a little uncertainty politically wise. You know, you have COVID like we do, uh, worse probably. And uh, the artists can help give hope. The artists can help educate. Uh, and, you know, with the idea that, um, you know, we'll come through this. It will be a better, stronger civilization because of it. Thank you. <laughs> I share with you the same thought. I, I, I believe in a better world. And for us, it's, it's very important because um, we, we want with this event, bring together different organizations in Brazil and, and, and show that we have to uh, be more um, effective as civil society. It's, it's, it's a hard work. It's it is not hard work. just uh, activities and go to Brasilia and say something to a deputy or it, it's more than that. It's, it it's about time. relationships. Yeah. It's about, yeah, it, yeah. it takes it, it, time. Proper, advoca proper advocacy takes a lot of time. And if you wait until you need something from an elected official, it's too late. You have to you know, build it up. It takes years. And so in, you know, for in Brazil, don't expect to go from zero to Americans for the Arts in two years or whatever. It took us 61 years so far in counting. And we're still not even close, um, but little steps. And little steps become medium steps and they become larger steps. And that's what you need to do. Start someplace and you'll be successful. Jay, thank you again because uh, we are going to talk about advocacy and strategy, but I think that examples it's, it's inspire and can say to, uh, can leave the message that it's possible. It's a hard work, in, but we have to do it to bring, bring some change. Otherwise, we, we we're not able to do this. So I'm a fan of American for the Arts and your job, and thank you. Thank you.